Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Nancy Ingavire Awayo, and I'm a second year PhD student at North Carolina State University in Civil Engineering. And the research that I present today is on assessing the influence of fluvial geomorphological variables on empirical models of ladder spreading. And this was conducted under the guidance of my advisors, uh, Drs. Cavas, Chamberlain, and Montoya. Following the 2010 to 2011 New Zealand Canterbury earthquake sequence, nearly 60,000 residential properties sustained liquefaction damages. Liquefaction is a result of the loss of shear strength of loose granular soil deposits from generation of excess pore water pressure. One of the major consequences of liquefaction is lateral spreading, which refers to the permanent horizontal ground deformations. This can be as small as a, a ground crack of a few centimeters to even tens of meters. This is a serious problem to the built environment and to life in earthquake prone regions. An even more serious problem is that our current approaches to predict lateral spreading can have a 50 to 200% error. Now, we believe that part of this variation can be explained by the fact that current models do not directly account for the influence of certain important geologic factors. Current models do consider certain topographic, basic stratigraphic parameters as color coded here in this equation. However, there is still a need to explore parameters that can better capture the effect of the deposition of processes and environments. To address this, our current focus is on identifying factors that are associated with the deposition of processes and environments that can help us improve our models. Now, since lateral spreading has been repeatedly observed near uh, rivers, we started by analyzing the features of a meandering river, especially since our case study is Christchurch, New Zealand. I will highlight some of these features and also share some of the proposed hypotheses and at the same time, uh, the simple ge geomorphic facies models and grain size trend on which they're based. To start off, the point bar refers to the landform inside of a meander bend and the cut bump refers to the outside. The deposits within a point bar are generally relatively young, young compared to the cut bank deposits as they're actively deposited as the river is migrating, while the cut bank is being eroded from older sediments. So as a result, our first hypothesis states that we expect more, la la more lateral spreading within the point bar than within the cut bank, because the sediments are younger, less consolidated, and more prone to liquefaction and its consequences as we see here in figure three. Now, within the point bar itself, we also have downstream finding as the velocity of flow is decreasing. And we also have a more well-graded distribution on the downstream end. So based on this, we state that our second hypothesis is that we expect more lateral spreading on the upstream side of the point bar than on the downstream side uh, of the point bar because of the downstream finding and possible interlocking of soil grains which can reduce the likelihood to liquefy in this case. And typically, these deposits are inclined at an angle of up to 20 degrees within the subsurface towards the river. And we believe that this is a better representation of the pre-existing static stresses than the topographic slope that we usually include in our motors. Therefore, our third hypothesis states that the higher this angle, the larger the deformation or lateral spreading. Now, based on the data we have available to us through the New Zealand Geotechnical Database around the Avon River, which as we can see here is also a meandering river here in Figure 4, uh, we were able to test the first two hypotheses using the observed ground cracks after the Christchurch New Zealand earthquake in 2011. First, we used uh, the average nearest neighbor statistical tool which uh, helped us check whether these ground cracks were randomly distributed or not. And I'll be happy to discuss more on this later. But after we confirmed that the uh, distribution of these cracks is non-random, we wanted to go further and assess whether they geomorphic and explain the non-random distribution based on the hypothesis we just discussed. For this, we calculated the density of the observed ground cracks for a given area using the point density tool in ArcMap, which is a GIS tool. 
to assess where the most deformations are, whether it's upstream versus downstream, inside versus the outside of a bend. Figure five here is an example of the point density map that we were able to generate. For example, if we're able to zoom here in this meander bend, it's this meander bend on, on the right. And then uh, in figure five, we have a summary of eight different meander bends that we looked at for the preliminary results. And uh, it shows also a comparison between the point bar and the cut bank, as well as the uh, downstream versus the upstream density of ground cracks. Now, looking at all these results, we can see that we have more deformations or ground cracks inside a point bar than the cut bunk. The same for uh, figure five, but we don't really see a large or consistent differences between uh, the upstream versus the downstream. Now, to further assess these results, we also conducted a t-test at a, significant, a significance level of 0 0.05, and we found similar results that uh, support the first hypothesis, but not enough for the second. So based on what I just discussed, we have, uh, we conclude that we have enough evidence to say that there is more lateral spreading in the point bar than in the cut bunk, but we don't have sufficient evidence to support the differences between uh, the upstream versus the downstream deformations, at least not yet. So since the uh, observed values support the first hypothesis, we estimated lateral spreading using the at all model for locations inside and outside of a meander bend, but we found that the model does not suggest any significant difference as shown here in figure seven. So our next steps include finalizing hypothesis testing, the ones we just discussed and more. And then once this is done, we can define proxy factors that can help us improve our predictive models. Thank you.